Good afternoon and good morning, depending where you're listening from. Uh, welcome to the African Arguments podcast, uh, brought to you by the Royal African Society and the International African Institute, uh, who run the African Arguments uh, website and book series. We are uh, absolutely delighted to welcome uh, today a distinguished cast led by K.Y. Amwako. And uh, I should explain first that the African Arguments uh, is designed to promote debate about major African issues, um, to allow alternative and dissenting voices to be heard and discussion to be engaged. One of the most debated issues uh, is how Africa can achieve faster economic growth, achieve that economic transformation that it seeks. All Africans aspire to a life that at the very least should provide for their basic needs, food, water, health, shelter, safety, justice, and most aspire to greater affluence, to the kind of economic transformation that we have already seen in Latin America and much of Asia. This was one of the great promises of the nationalist movements that fought for and won independence. But in the 60 years since then, Though liberation in the South took longer, Africa's fortunes have fluctuated. There was an initial, initial period of rapid growth, which stalled, and in some cases went even backwards in the 70s and 80s. And other countries fell into conflict or suffered impoverishment uh, in another way from disaster or war. But then things began to get better. Uh, Africa has never been short of prescriptions. Doctors, uh, many from outside the continent, have gathered around the patient, shaking their heads and writing books about you know, why is Africa poor and what should we do about it? How do you develop Africa? What is the path for progress in Africa? And all these kind of things. One man has lived through this whole post-independence period of Africa, and for the last 50 of them has been very deeply engaged in all the economic debates about, that we have just discussed. And this is K.Y. Amuako. He's not a, 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 the kind who uh, pontificated in print. Uh, he is more been working in the engine room of economic policy. He's a sort of economic engineer. And his interest is not only in getting the policy right, but in getting it done. And that has meant persuading political leaders and ordinary people that the ideas uh, are right on economic policy and that they should accept them being put into practice. He's now published a book explaining how to do it, because he has done it. Know the Beginning Well is the subtitle of an inside uh, journey, his subtitle, an inside journey through five decades of African development. Here it is, the book. Which I hope many of you have already seen, if not already read. No one, I think, has been more closely engaged than KY in the making of economic policy in Africa or in the discussions with the people who were going to make it happen. After two decades as one of Africa's most senior economists at the World Bank, KY was then appointed head of the UN's Economic Commission for Africa and spent a decade there, during which uh, both the ECA and KY helped transform economic policy by being a, a policy motor for the continent as a whole. Since he left, he spent the next two decades promoting uh, economic transformation and the thinking around it from the African Center for Economic Transformation based in Accra, ASSET, as uh, we call it, and has you returned KY to uh, your country of origin to push forward this agenda. So to stimulate the debate uh, about KY's book, we published three commentaries on the African Arguments website earlier this week. Uh, one from Alex Dewal, who sadly can't join us today. Uh, a second from Shanta Devarajan, who happily is with us. And a third uh, that I contributed myself. But we're also joined on the panel today, uh, besides KY, uh, by his uh, successor, one of his successors as Chief Economist for Africa at the World Bank, Albert Zufak, and by the AU Special Envoy for Gender, Ineta Diop. Uh, more from them later. But uh, KY, I'd like first of all to pass the floor to you to uh, explain a little bit about the origins of your book, what it's about, and some of the comments that have been made about it. So KY, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Nick. 
for, for your uh, warm introduction. And I also want to thank you and your colleagues of the Rare Africa Society for planning this event and making it possible for all of us to be here today. I also want to thank all those who have tuned in today uh, to hear me speak about my book. And thanks for the nice and kind reviews that you, Shanta and um, Alex, have put online to stimulate our discussions today. Uh, let me start off by answering the question that many people always ask me. KY, why did you write this book? And as you all know by now, I said I took the title of I was inspired by the African proverb. If you know the beginning well, the end shall not trouble you. Uh, Tali, can you take off the slide, the display of the screen now? In terms of uh, the proverb says, if you know the beginning well, the end shall not trouble you. And that's what inspired me to write this book. Uh, I was 30 years old at Ghana's independence. I've been fortunate to work on many of the issues and have been involved with many of the policies, key players and leaders that have shaped the course of Africa's development. My career has been very expansive, uh, which Shanta in his review touched upon. I worked for 20 years at the World Bank, then 10 years at the ECA Economic Commission for Africa. And since 2008, I've been working on with the African Center for Economic Transformation that I founded in that year based in Accra. So let me quickly go through some of the key highlights of my career and some of the issues I dealt with that can inform our discussions today. And in the book, I talk a lot about my career at the bank. I worked in many departments across many institutions and in the regions of the bank, but the bulk of my experience was working on Africa. And in Africa in particular, I had various positions and well, at some stage I was in charge of six countries in Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, and Mauritius, and Uganda, of course. And those were where I really honed in my discussions with governments and policymakers, from Museveni to Kenneth Kaunda, all these leaders, and in the case of Zambia, I lived there as a World Bank representative for four years. And some of the key lessons I learned from working on these countries, and I won't go into all the details, but at the end of my period in the World Bank, I came to the conclusion, especially in the context of structural adjustment lending, in the context of policy discussions, and seeing African countries implement these policies, what worked, what didn't work. There were key, some key lessons I learned. The first lesson is that smart policies matter a lot. The second is that to implement smart policies, you need institutional effectiveness and capacity. And those two things that allow you to come ownership of the development agenda and ownership matters a lot. So policies, institutional effectiveness capacity leads to ownership. And without ownership, countries' policies will not be implemented. And that's one key lesson we learned from what went wrong with structural adjustment. And above all, to do all these things well, you need strong visionary leadership that can implement policies, that can push others to greater heights, that govern selflessly, it's important, and leadership that builds trust. So those were the lessons I learned from, and we can go into some of the details later. From there, I went to the Economic Commission for Africa, and I applied some of these same lessons 
at a different level, working with policymakers and leaders on the regional issues on a continental basis. I went there at a very interesting time. I think Nick, you made a point that I was lucky when I got to the EC. There was a certain confluence of events that was driving the African uh, uh, agenda in a very positive direction. First, there were the so-called, <laughs> now I say so-called new generation of leaders coming to the scene. They all wanted to assert Africa's ownership of the development agenda that I've just mentioned. There was also a recognition at that time that the debt crisis had to be resolved immediately in better ways for development. And that we needed to shift from structural adjustment to poverty reduction and meeting the NDGs, the long-term goals. So there was this sense happening and that there was greater push for transparency and accountability in government and civil society were beginning to make their voices felt in Africa. And I also, there was a strong need for changing the partnership with the development community to make it more on an equal footing so that Africa's voice and Africa's perspectives can drive the agenda. So that was a contest happening in, especially around towards the late 80, 90s and early 2000s. So that's where I came in and we put in a lot of initiatives. Much of it is described in Shanta's uh, 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 piece and also Nikki talked about that and Alex uh, in terms of aid defensiveness, in terms of uh, the debt crisis that I've mentioned. So these were, we, and we had several initiatives that we brought in, working with African leaders towards the African peer review mechanism, towards the NEPAD. Those are all described in the book. Uh, we use our convenient power. And I was also lucky, Boutros Gali was the one who recruited me to the ECA and a couple of years, Kofi Annan took over. So I could work very closely with Kofi Annan and all the heads of the UN agencies. So the ECA became the central point where much of these discussions were taking place, whether it was on HIV, AIDS. So that was the setting. And which we then came up with several policies, proposals that led to many of the initiatives that are on the ground today. There were two other areas that I want to put on the table because I, I think we have to touch upon them in this discussion today. One was the whole issue of gender equality. And I went in and my favorite chapter in the book, as uh, Mineta knows, is chapter eight. He talks about the moral and economic imperatives of gender equality in Africa. And it was very personal to me because I allow my own family, my mothers, she was an illiterate, she never went to school. And as an African mother, I could see her life and the poverty that she lived in. So I was inspired by that. And when I went to the World Bank and I became head, that of education and social policy, I had to move the World Bank, as Shanta says, to make sure that knowledge came ahead of lending. <laughs> And in the area of gender in some of these areas, we did some real path breaking work that led to the Beijing agenda. So in that context that I went to the ECA and I carried on, and I'm sure I'll, I'll leave uh, Minta to share some of the details with you. Another area that also was important and it's also so important today was the whole issue of regional integration. Because I bring that up, you know, because we had the regional economic communities, we've had the Abuja Treaty, we've talked for a long time about regional integration, but we're not making any progress. So I was determined that analytically, the ECA should get into these issues and help drive the agenda. So we did a lot of studies, a lot of reports, annual assessments of regional integration, meeting with the heads of the regional economic communities, on the eve of the AU, OE turning into the African Union, we brought civil society to so many people to Addis Ababa, 
to talk about the role of the African Union in the, uh, the transition from the OAU to the African Union and what we needed to do. And then we set up the Africa Trade Policy Center at the EC to push the analytical work over the years. And I'm happy to say that now we're talking about the Africa Free Trade Continental Area Agreement and much of the work at the ECA and much of the work that the Africa Trade Policy Center has been doing over the years since I left has pushed us today. So the Iridia integration agenda is very important. So when I left the ECA in 2005, I just realized Africa had made some progress. We moved from the hopeless Africa to the hopeful Africa to Africa rising narrative, as you all recall, the economist magazine in particular. But I also said the more things change, the more they stay the same. And those African countries were not transforming their economies. And that without that transformation, we will never be able to achieve our overall goals. So I decided to set up the African Center for Economic Transformation in Accra to drive the transformation agenda. And I remember I consulted a lot of heads of states. They said, this is a good idea. But people say, what do you mean by transformation? It means different things to different people. So we had to, again, center knowledge, knowledge. Uh, and I bear with Grizzly, we did a lot of analytical studies and we are doing that. And we use that to drive the development agenda and to discuss with people. So to us at Asset, our goal in transformation is to make sure that African countries can diversify their products and services, that we can become competitive in the export market, export competitiveness, that we can increase productivity across the board in manufacturing, in agriculture, and that's what it will take for the transfer transformation. We need to upgrade our technology across board. These days we're talking about digital technology, so technology, technology across board to increase productivity. And above all, that will lead to what we call human well-being. So to us, it's a growth with depth where the depth, D-E-P-T-H, are the attributes that I've described today. And that's what we have been doing at the EST to move the African agenda forward. Quickly, briefly, and I'll finish. In the next couple of months, we are coming with two major reports. One is the African Transformation Index, which tracks or measuring the progress African countries have made, individual countries, we 32 countries over the last 20 years on the basis of these indicators that I've mentioned. So that report will go into great detail and tell you the sober news is that Africa we are transforming, but very slowly according to these indicators. So the question is how can we push forward and particularly in the area of COVID, it's going to be even more difficult. All this requires great leadership, visionary leadership, but we all need to work together for Africa's economic transformation. So this report, and then we have another report coming up on regional integration and how regional integration is going to be critical to drive the agenda forward. So let me stop here, Nick, and, and say thank you very much for this opportunity. There's a lot to be to discuss. Hey, why? Thank you very much. That's a big agenda for yeah. our uh, short time. So yeah. let me not hesitate, but pass straight on to uh, Professor Shanta Devarajan. Um, uh, Shanta is the professor of the practice of international development at Georgetown University's uh, School of Foreign Service, uh, where he's a colleague alongside Madeleine Albright and other luminaries. Um, you worked for many years also in the World Bank. And before that, uh, studied or taught at Princeton, Harvard, uh, University of California at Berkeley. Um, I won't elaborate, but uh, Shanta, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Nick. And uh, I want to start by saying what an honor it is to have be among this distinguished panel and have a chance to uh, exchange some ideas uh, that have been provoked by KY's book, uh, Know the Beginning Well. Um, so. Uh, what I would say is that there are two ways to look at this book. One is 
to consider it as a memoir of a, of a remarkable life and a remarkable career over 50 years, as, as everyone said. Um, and the other remarkable thing about it is that it's a memoir that speaks from the head and from the heart. You really get a sense of KY's emotional reactions to some of the uh, events uh, unfolding as much as how he was trying to, to analyze them and think through them. So for instance, he does talk about the, the, the racism he experienced as a, as a young African, uh, young professional at the World Bank, and there were very few Africans at the World Bank. And this is racism, not just among uh, colleagues at the bank, but also some of it actually in the continent, on the continent, in Africa, too. There were some Africans who said they couldn't learn much from fellow Africans uh, like, uh, like KY. Uh, the, his experience as, as uh, uh, country economist for Sudan and the resident representative for Zambia really talks about the, the crying need for policy reform, as KY mentioned this morning as well. Uh, particularly in the areas of agricultural subsidies or debt, uh, uh, debt restructuring, and the difficulty in bringing along the heads of state to, to take, particularly Kenneth Kaunda, to take on these reforms. Uh, and then, as, as again, he mentioned, uh, as director of education and social policy, as the first director of education and social policy at the World Bank, he had this tension because the bank was used to doing what I would describe as heavy metal projects, you know, large infrastructure projects. And these sectors, which were considered soft sectors, really required not just large heavy metal projects, but really a lot of knowledge assistance uh, on, on policies and institutions. And he had to navigate that because the, 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 the culture at the bank was into heavy lending. And I, I, I can't resist quoting this one line where he was very proud of the fact that they, they produced in one year, eight analytical reports in, in, in two years, sorry. And then he adds, yes, we technocrats get excited about these things. And that's something that I know Albert and I can relate to uh, very closely. And then the, the uh, you know, when he was offered the uh, UNECA job as executive secretary, I mean, this is arguably the, the most prominent job, the best job for somebody who wants to work on Africa. It's the top job. He was reluctant initially, but he was reluctant because of his family. You know, the, his children were in high school and college at the time. His wife was starting a career, building a career at the World Bank, and he just didn't want to disrupt the family. And it was actually his wife, I think, who finally convinced him that he should take this job uh, because this was what he uh, always wanted to do. And then when he got to ECA, he realized it was somewhat of a demoralized institution. He had to turn it around. And the way he did it was actually to talk to everybody in the institution. He created these open space forums for staff to, to register what their concerns were, what their hopes were, what they, what they wanted to do. And that made the, the, this is coming back to the theme of ownership, that made the reforms that he introduced better owned by the, by the people who had to implement them. And then as, as he has mentioned already, that enabled ECA to take on some continent-wide initiatives like debt relief, uh, gender equity, and, and, and aid. But he also, I think, during that period in, at, at ECA, recognized that the key binding constraint to African development was governance. And he decided to take that governance mantle head on, started publishing the African uh, governance indicators, and then uh, played a key role in the Africa peer review mechanism, which is one of the most important initiatives on the continent uh, in terms of governance. And then finally, went all the way into the knowledge business uh, by for, uh, founding a think tank uh, asset uh, on the continent and also becoming a member of civil society, having served in multilateral institutions all the time uh, before that. But there's another way to think about this book uh, rather than a fascinating memoir, which is it's a window into the history of African development over the last 50 years. It really is almost like a textbook. I mean, as a professor, I want to use it in my course uh, as a textbook uh, uh, for, for my students. 
And the thing that's remarkable about that textbook or about the, about the, the portrayal of African development is that most of the problems that KY encountered over the 50 years are still here. And that's what I want to you know, use this time to, to explore a little bit. I mean, the racism is still around. I mean, I, I, I published a blog from uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Celestin Monga, just a few months ago, uh, just documenting the kind of racism that African economists have faced in international organizations uh, quite recently. I, the other thing is Sudan today has problems with agricultural subsidies and with debt. 40 years later, Zambia has got a huge debt crisis. I think they just defaulted on their sovereign uh, bond payments a few, a few months ago. Um, so the, the problems haven't gone away. The tension between knowledge and lending at the World Bank and other multilateral banks is still there. It's still very heightened and particularly in the COVID crisis became uh, really a cause celebre. Um, and then finally, the governance the governance constraint is still uh, is still with us, as as is the the, the, the gender problem. When I think about the, the high fertility rates, early child marriage, particularly in the Sahel regions, you know, this has got to be the highest priority for African development today, and KY recognized it 20, 30 years ago. And so then the question is, what can we do based on all this? this knowledge that we've gained and this experience to try to address these problems so that we're not talking about them 50 years from now again. And that's where I think there's one uh, critical element in the, in the approach to governance that needs to change. And I saw it, I, I found it missing in the book. Um, and, and that is that you know, there's a fundamental problem with governance because most of the people who are practicing, well, if you define governance as a failure of the government to be accountable to the people, to, the, to its citizens, then when you, if you try to address governance by talking to those same governments, the leaders who are unaccountable to their people, you're not gonna get very far because there's a reason why they don't wanna be accountable to the people. And that is the governance problem. So I think the, the way we can approach governance has to be by talking to the people, to the citizens, and finding a way to empower them, to provide them with knowledge, provide them with information, provide them with instruments so that they can hold governments accountable. And that's where I think the approach has to be, is, 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 is not necessarily discussing with leaders all the time, what can we do about governance because they are the problem, <laughs> but rather discussing with the people, the, the, the woman in the village and finding out a way in which she can be held, she can be empowered in order to hold her governments uh, accountable. And so we have to do much more on that in that realm. And I frankly think that the international organizations because of their relationship with governments have a hard time doing this. And that's why I think asset and other institutions and Georgetown University and others are better positioned to be able to promote that. And just to conclude, I would also salute the Royal Africa Society as one other uh, 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 mechanism by which we can actually bring governance reform to the people. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Shanta. And you raised some important questions we'll come back to. And I'd just like to draw uh, participants' uh, attention to the fact that we are very keen for you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A function, and we'll try and pick those up in the discussion to follow. But I'd like to move along next to um, uh, Albert Zufak. Thank you very much for joining us uh, at short notice from uh, the World Bank. Uh, Albert is the World Bank's chief economist for Africa, uh, following in um, KY's footsteps. Um, you uh, have uh, studied at the University of Yaoundé and Clermont-Ferrand in France. Uh, you've worked for the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund, but you've spent a lot of time at the World Bank. Uh, let me pass the floor to you. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Nick. It's 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 an honour and privilege to be uh, to be on this panel and to uh, to speak about uh, this 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 wonderful book, uh, one I have read many times now. 
because uh, the you know, first time I took it, I called KY and said, come on, I can't stop reading it. Uh, this is a fantastic book. And, and to me, really, it's a great honor and privilege to be uh, on this panel. And, and, and again, as you said, on the footstep of giants like uh, KY and Shanta, you know, uh, you know, who had my job before. So uh, great, great, great uh, privilege. Now, this book is, is about people. It's about, you know, institutions and it's about policies. And KY started with policies. And, you know, a fantastic, journey that looks at what kind of policies has shaped African development is what you will find in this book. A wonderful journey defining uh, the different stages at which Africa has gone through, uh, you know, in, in its development journey, it's, it's clearly one thing that comes out extremely clearly in this book. You, 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 you know, reading this book, there's a clear understanding of the adjustment years, but also of the kind of initiatives that were taken on the continent, on the policy side throughout the past six decades. On the people side, the book is not just talking about leaders, it's also talking about the family. And as Shanta has mentioned, KY's mom and his family occupy a central place in this book. And, and those people, leaders, family, are complemented towards the end of the book by another category of people, the youth, which KY positions to be the next leadership journey. And, and that is something I really, really like about the book. On institutions, it's about better understanding institutions that shape African development. The World Bank, the UNECA, but also the founding of an institution that in Africa could generate the kind of knowledge that guides policy on the continent, asset that he has created. So it's about policies, people, institutions. And I would add, if you know, another P, it's about principles. It's about principles and this run through the book, you know, either through um, you know, uh, you know, the long description of, of the hopeful years of Nkrumah and Kaunda and, and, and Nyerere and other fathers of African independence, but it's also about the principles that should guide Africa's transformation. So this to me is fantastic and, and this is a, a wonderful book. Now let me say that reading this book, I was clearly, you know, I stopped on, on the title first, know the beginning well. And, and reading the book, I was actually looking for that beginning. What is that beginning KY is talking about? But I didn't find one beginning, I found many beginnings. And I found a, an extremely interesting coincidence of, or two beginnings. KY is born in 1944, exactly at the same time the, the Bretton Woods you know, system is created. <laughs> and that, he probably didn't put this in the book, but I thought it was a very strange coincidence. I didn't know. And, <laughs> <laughs> so, so coincidence there, uh, that those two beginning collide. But, but throughout the book, there are so many other beginnings. You have 
um, you know, the, the independence, the hopeful years of the independence in Africa, but also the disillusions. You have the beginning, you know, at the World Bank in 1974, although I had, I know, I hope he had actually started with the real World Bank beginning. And because it could have helped us, you know, um, you know, better understand that environment he described. 74 is when he joins the World Bank, but, but the focus of the World Bank group on Africa started with IDA creation, you know, in, 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 in 60. And when you look at that beginning, you know, you may be able to better understand, you know, the environment and, and race relations that KY describes in the book, because who was a development expert in 1960? Very likely, a, you know, someone who has lived in colonies before. So that beginning could have certainly helped us understanding better, you know, the broader environment and what happened later on. So the first point was, it's not one beginning, it's many beginnings, right? And, 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 and that is, to me, fascinating. You find those beginnings across the, um, the, uh, the book. And, and the other beginning that is extremely important from my perspective is the emergence of that transformational leaders that coincided with KY's, uh, you know, stint at the UNECA. You know, people like Becky, he speaks a lot, speaks volume in the book about Becky, about, you know, uh, you know about Meles, you know, about, you know, uh, all the, the transformative leaders who basically created that new African Renaissance idea. And I, and I thought that was, that, 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 that was fascinating. The next point I'm going to make is this book is a fascinating rear view mirror. But just like you read in, in those you know, rear view mirrors, objects are closer than they appear. And, and here coming, you know, you know, agreeing with Shanta that when you look at issues discussed in the book, you know, the first reaction is to believe, my God, these are all present today. These issues haven't changed that much. Uh, you know, as Shanta put it in his blog, uh, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. No, um, you, you have that impression that, you know, this is not about the past. We're living through it. We're still living through it. But my next point is where I'm going to, um, you know, uh, differ from uh, Shanta. And being an optimist like uh, KY and, 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 and late Kofi Annan, who, uh, who, who gave the, pre the, the, the preface of this book, being an optimist, I actually see change that has happened. When we look at issues, we have the impression that they haven't changed, but there's actually quite a lot of change happening, not only in these institutions, but also on, in Africa. In the institutions, and the book does talk about the cultural revolution that KY lived through in his team at the back. And that cultural revolution, you know, I actually experienced a little bit of it in my early years in the bank when late Wolfenson came into the bank and changed the paradigm towards country ownership. Speaking of putting the, 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 the countries in the driver's seat, thinking of actually hearing the African voice. These are things that certainly were not on the agenda until the early 90s in the bank. And um, I do remember those days, some managers or some high level executive were so uh, convinced that Wolfenson was wrong that they left the World Bank. How can he even think that 
the Africans could know what they want. Or, you know, what an idea to believe that these Africans would have a view on their development path. That was revolutionary. And I think that has changed and we definitely continuing on that path of making sure we have a clear sense of ownership and what countries actually are definitely discussing. The second area, which may look the same, but that has also evolved quite a lot, is debt and African financing. Yes, we're still talking of a debt issue today. Countries like Zambia are in debt distress. We are now discussing the common framework, you know, for a number of African countries. But there again, things have changed significantly. African countries have had access to markets. African countries, debt, the debt structure of African countries has significantly changed to the point that today, close to half of the debt is not from international institutions. It's not multilateral debt. That has good and bad things, but clearly that situation has changed and the debate on debt solutions and debt treatments today is definitely different from what the hippie was. So it's a completely different discussion that we're having today. We have had China coming in the, you know, in the game. We have had non-Paris club members as we call them. We have had you know, private creditors coming in. It may have complicated the issue, but it's clearly very, very different. And you know, let me end uh, on, on, on racism that uh, uh, Shanta has mentioned that is also discussed in the book. Here too, we have the impression that it's, the situation is still the same. We do have uh, today at the World Bank, a committee, you know, a task force to address this issue, which may leave us with the impression that nothing has changed. But here too, I see change. And the change is that we are actually talking openly about it. We are discussing this and we are coming up with solutions that are discussed at all meetings, not only with staff, but with senior management within the World Bank. 93, when I came to the bank, the World Bank for the first time, you could not utter the word racism. And any inclination that, you know, suggestion that there could be discrimination could really be harmful to you. So here too, I see change happening. And the last point, and to KY's credit that I want to make, is there has also been a big change in thinking. The fact that KY has created asset, and asset has now set the agenda for economic development in Africa to the point that today, the jobs and economic transformation is not just part of IDA commitment, it's at the center of our strategy in the Africa region. It's all credit to you, KY. It is exactly the proof that the work you have done over the past 50 years has not gone to waste. And I would like to stop here, thanking you and really uh, being, you know, again, thanking the Royal Africa Society for really, uh, you know, convening this event. And, and thank you so much, KY, for everything you have done. Thanks. Thank you, Albert. Uh, and some important points there, again, that we need to take up later about the African voice and the, the formulae. But I'd like to turn now to uh, Vineta Diop. Uh, Vineta, you are very welcome. You are especially welcome because you are the only one of our speakers who has not worked at the World Bank. And that's a very important Thank role you. for you to play. I know you are a campaigner, uh, above all for gender, for women's rights across Africa, and you've done many jobs. You are the founder and president of Femme Afrique Solidarité. Uh, you are currently the AU's special envoy uh, of the chairperson for women, peace and security. You've been extremely active in this field for many years. You know what struggle means. Uh, let me pass the floor to you uh, for your contribution, please. Vineta. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nick, uh, for inviting me to be 
part of this, this discussion with the so high level session, uh, I found it difficult to make a critique of such a masterpiece, uh, but I will uh, just, um, you know, offer some thoughts and hope it will be helpful. I think uh, uh, when I uh, read the book, I, it's for me a source of inspiration to many of us, not just uh, uh, to the World Bank or other institution, uh, but also to our children. Um, you know, when you discover the author, KY, a young African boy, you know, born in Africa to an ordinary family in Ghana, raised without uh, a mother who has become the KY, who contributed to shaping the global development agenda, as well as the macroeconomic policies in Africa. So this is the KY we know today. So the work of this great man continued to impact the life of ordinary citizens in Africa, in particular women and youth. It has been highlighted uh, by uh, many of us in this, uh, um, in this panel. Um, you know, I, it, I recall uh, what Obama said, uh, yes, we can, but I know that now today we can say KY, yes, we did. And as, that's what I wanted to uh, amplify. And you know, the book is not just about a dream, but a vision, a commitment to action, to make change. And indeed, it's about leadership. For me, that's what I'm reading it. It's about lead, the type of leadership we need to make that transformational change in Africa. So KY, okay, thank you for sharing uh, you know, your compelling journey and experience in this book, which everybody should be reading from top down, uh, bottom up. My comment will focus on chapter eight of this book in which he make a clear and convincing case of gender equality. I think this chapter resonates particularly with me, given my own life and my own um, experience. Last year, we celebrate Beijing 25, you know, 25 of Beijing, it has been very much in the, at the center of the book or of the chapter eight. And we know that Africa has made tremendous, uh, you know, um, some step over gender equality and women's empowerment. But, and in, unfortunately, and it's a big but uh, that a lot still need to be done. When we look at the pandemic, the COVID-19, and we see the gender gap that it has uh, uh, exacerbated. And uh, when I see uh, the uh, World Economic Report who predicts that it will now take more than 100 years to reach parity at this path. So that is what we are seeing, even though we have made some step to gender equality and women's empowerment. One thing that I saw in the book that uh, Gewai experienced is the, some of the phenomenon that we have in Africa, the cultural and social barriers on women. KY experienced the shadow of uh, polygamy. You know, myself, I come from the poly polygynous, I would say, family myself. So I will not dwell on the negative or positive effect of such situation. But I confirm, though, the evidence is clear that traditional and cultural barriers and practices harmful to women and girls remain key obstacle for women's empowerment and leadership. Um, so the author is a true example of someone raised in a traditional setting, but who questioned the statu quo and become the leader and champion we know today. I don't think that there is anyone in this room, the virtual room, who can disagree with the power of education. Education is one of the key drivers to challenge that statu quo. So it's not surprising then to see that Dr. K.Y. Amoako, 
engage in the change he wants to see, starting with his three daughters who are highly accomplished women. So now uh, KY also understood early in the need, very early. And I think uh, he, when he was at World Bank, even in Africa, uh, the value of allyship and mentorship. And when I read the book, I saw it was not just at the ECA, but whenever he was found himself in the World Bank, he identified smart and capable women to put in them into posts and to mentor them. So much at uh, one point he was gently accused of having only one other token men in the room. So I think that is uh, the KY we know uh, today. Uh, the book also describes how one man can build a life and has been said by Albert, you know, listening to women and then use his influence and development strategy and policy of financial inclusion, which put gender equality at the center. You know, he helped uh, to change the terminology for women as beneficiary or as victim to women as active of change, social and economic change. I think that's, we need to uh, uh, see, even in conflict zone where I'm working and become agent of transformation that just like seeing them as victim. So Dr. Amoako work in the World Bank is a testimony also that you need to have courage. So men of courage to call for an accountability mechanism. When he put uh, the index at the ECA, we say, oh, you want to measure member state commitment, the policy to go into implementation and to ensure the presence of women at the table, not only in numbers, but with real cloud. So more than ever, particularly at the time of this COVID, leadership matters, and I think, uh, and gender women leadership matter most. Um, and um, when I see KY paying tribute to many women, President Ellen Johnson said, Gertrude Mongena, Dr. Kazibwe, Josephine Uedrago, uh, Joyce Menz called many others in this book. But these women, they twin, and I like that, they twin with KY and others who thought like him and it was mentioned again by Albert that uh, head of state Meles um, was one a great ally, Tambombeki, Abdullaiwad, Kofi Annan, and they made a critical and formidable partnership with those heads of state. You need them to make that transformation change. So let me just share quickly one uh, of my several experience with KY as he already mentioned in the book, I was among the women attending the 40th anniversary of the ECA. I was then very young, dynamic campaigning um, uh, from OAU to the AU to say we need gender equality within the mechanism. So KY sees the opportunity of uh, uh, the 40th anniversary to convince another man, Salim Ahmed Salim, I remember I was running after them and uh, lobbying, but he was convinced he had an agenda from Kampala uh, to Addis Ababa. So they launched the African Women Committee for Peace and Development. And through this work and mechanism, all of us were rallied behind African women. What we did, we achieved, we lobbied through the mechanism to achieve the parity that we see at the African Union right now, at the top level. Musafaki, the deputy is a woman. Commissioner, one man, one woman. So that's the work that um, uh, we have achieved with the leadership of KY and also the Maputo Protocol and the, the Solemn Declaration on Gender Equality. Those are two progressive instruments for African women and thanks to KY. So my dear brother, Dr. Amwako, I think you were guided by the mother's, your mother's spirit, the almost invisible women in this book who could not be there during your childhood. This is a missing link of your life. One might uh, also feel that 
herself, she felt she could transition while you were dedicating the 40th anniversary to making like, uh, you know, more equal for other women. I think she felt it when you were telling her bye-bye that you were going to support African women in your journey. She died right at that time. But KY, you should find comfort in this. Paradise is open at the command of mothers. Your mother is resting in peace and proud of her son for what he has accomplished. So then myself, I feel so honored uh, to continue to be with you, a good friend, uh, but also a mentor, uh, somebody who have shown me the way to navigate at AU, supporting anytime we had obstacle. And um, right now being in the TLP with assets, I'm very proud and I benefit. I continue to benefit from your wisdom as the struggle because it's still there of gender equality and women empowerment continues. So for the Royal um, uh, University, uh, uh, I'm very proud that you, you know, you put this book at the front, Nick and your team, uh, the Royal African Society. And I'm very happy to be invited and contributed to the discussion. Thank you so much. And be with a professor uh, that I know I have met many times at the World Bank um, in Africa, Shanta, but also to be with Albert. Thank you, KY. Ineta, thank you so much for your contribution and for, for highlighting that which I, what I think is a very important theme of the book and the, of KY, of, of your work uh, in every institution where you've been. Um, I just remind uh, uh, the audience that uh, we are open to questions and answers. And I'd like to uh, move straight away uh, to some of the questions and some of the issues that have been raised in these commentaries, uh, KY. And in particular, can I come straight to quite a fundamental one, which is whether this, uh, what you might call the World Bank formula, the Washington Consensus, has actually led Africa astray. And we, it's put very bluntly by um, Nigel Stewart in the questions. Um, that are the World Bank, the international financial institutions as a whole, actually imposing a formula that it has neo-colonial effects by tying Africa into a world economy where its, its position remains unequal. And it is it, the reason it has struggled to achieve this transformation, this breakthrough, is because there is a, there is a perpetually unequal exchange there. And will these traditional formulae that uh, we've all said, you know, this liberalization and the rest, are we barking up the wrong tree? What is your experience there? Yeah, my, uh, it's a very good question. And I write about that in the book. And that was the start of structural adjustment in Africa, which coincided with the Washington consensus. So for Africa, when you talk about Washington consensus, it's about structural adjustment and what it led us to. So we need to start from there. And clearly, as I said in the book, I was the only African economist on the team that wrote the Agenda for Action, Accelerated Development in Africa Agenda for Action, that sparked the bank shift and policies. And I remember the debates we were having in the team. And at that time, the US and the others were pushing very strongly on this whole idea, liberalization, get the prices right, the whole paradigm. And that's what's wrong with Africa. And in terms of, you have to know the, the, the beginning well, it was the African ministers or governors at the bank who requested the bank to do a report to try to explain why African economies were not growing and the challenges we're having in the 70s and then later in the 80s. So the, the team was put together to write a report. And the debates being the only African, and Africa were moving too much to, oh, get the prices right. All the problems are government, right? Government intervention is a problem. So cast up to do this crisis. Anyway, we came up with the report. In terms of a diagnosis of the, some of the problems, they were spot on. 
some of the things African, but the, the prescriptions about how to go about them. That's where we went astray. And that's why I brought up the ownership issue and the way the report was disseminated and discussed within the involved African countries, even in the process of writing the report. We came up with the report and we started disseminating. And to his credit, Adebayo Adedeji, who was then the head of the ECA, came in and blasted the bank and the report. This is stupid. And the Bank Africa had come up with its own agenda. I think the Lagos plan of action and they were touting. So there was this conflict from the very beginning. That's one lesson. Now, in terms of, so my answer is yes, you're right. We pushed the Washington consensus. It was not collaborative. And because the, that's why I draw the issue of ownership and the capacity and institutions. Because we put this and the governments have to implement. And I tell you, many of the governments are there to I can go on and on didn't believe what we're in what they were doing. <laughs> they didn't believe in what we were doing. And I will, I'll stop right. The only example, I, and Kaunda, not Kaunda, Museveni, to his credit, he had come in and taken over the government. The come was in the mess. He needed to reform. Nisha, he didn't want even to talk to us. Anyway, I went in, I had a six hour debate with him, six hours about all these policies. But so when he got it, he realized some of these issues were right on, but he then took charge. <laughs> and, and I remember one of his ministers telling me, KY, we are doing this not because you buy us at the World Bank are telling us some of this, but we believe it's right for us. So that's my answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to, you, uh, you touched on a point that was also raised by uh, Sadru Nazarali. You know, what was the impact of the nationalizations in the 1970s? But I'd like to take it a bit further and come back to Albert as well, because uh, in recent years, there's been a lot of focus on the role of the developmental state and uh, a sort of more directed form of development, taking some inspiration from China, it, it has to be said, and which at least for some time appears to have been extremely successful in one or two countries of which Ethiopia was the poster boy, uh, Rwanda is still trying to, um, but that model too is coming up against its, uh, its constraints. And these are perhaps will lead us to the third question, which is the one of governance. But it is, what, is, what should be, how active should the state be? Um, and Albert, you're, the, you're now the person dispensing uh, the advice on the inside. <laughs> so I'd be interested in your view on this. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Nick. Um, again, this is one of these areas where I would believe uh, we've been evolving. And, and sometimes it feels like we are evolving, but in a circle. We've, we've gone from you know, the 70s, 60s, 70s, where the state had a huge role to the 80s where you know, there was almost no role for the, the state to one where we are now circling back to a, a better position, I would believe, because it's basically about finding the right equilibrium between the public and the private sector. And it's all about building those productive partnership between the public and the private sector, because um, you know, economic history is absolutely clear. There are clear market failures for which you need a state intervention. We can certainly discuss you know, how you get innovation, <clears throat> which is a key to productivity growth going. But across the world, because there are some clear market failures, there's a role for the state to step in and really ignite innovation. And we see this across the world. We see it in the US and everywhere else. So my answer to you, Nick, is um, the, you know, it's, it's you know, the question of the, the, the size of the state to me is always one that is, um, you know, probably overblown. The right question is the quality of the state the efficiency 
through which public investment, for example, is, uh, is implemented. And we are now focusing quite a lot on public investment management, which is how do you select those projects? How do you implement them? How do you make sure they do have an impact? Right? So it's, it's the right uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, state, not just the size of the state. Thanks. Mm. And I, I think that that poses the question, though, how you deal with the market failure when it is a global market failure that disadvantages Africa. And it's not one that individual states can deal with. And, and that's where KY's theme of regional integration strikes me as a, continuing to be a really important one. And obviously, the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCFTA, will be an important ingredient on that. Now, we know from trying to build one in Europe that these are extremely political projects and very difficult because there are tough compromises that need to be uh, reached. And uh, is Africa in a position where it can get its own act together to the extent that it can then wield the weight that is justified? Uh, on the world stage. I mean, there is now a tremendous opportunity with uh, Ngozi as, as head of WTO for Africa's voice to be more solidly put in the world economic institutions. But can Africa itself? Uh, I don't know whether uh, who would like to comment on that, but it, it is an important issue if some of these uh, global market imbalances are to be uh, addressed. Shanta, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Okay, I'll try. <laughs> um, we have to understand a few things here, uh, or, or clarify a few things. What, there, there's no question there's an unequal exchange in the global marketplace. The market failures or the, or the distortions in the global marketplace are, say, things like European agricultural subsidies. Uh, the, these are the interventions that uh, are creating uh, some of the imbalances. But then you ask the question, what is, if, given that there are European agricultural subsidies, what is the best strategy that an African country can undertake? Because frankly, I don't see much possibility that any, Af any African country can convince the European taxpayers that they should stop subsidizing their agriculture. That's not gonna happen. So then you say, let's take those subsidies as given. What's the best strategy for a small country, say for Ghana or Togo or, or Benin? And it turns out that is actually to liberalize your trade, to, to actually open up your markets, because that's the best you can do, given that they're not going to change their, uh, their subsidy policy. And I think that's the, that's the key lesson that we've learned. Uh, and that's, that's essentially what the Asian countries have been, have been doing. Mm. They, they've been faced with the same global imbalances and their approach has been, we're not gonna, try, we, we're not gonna succeed if we try to change the way the Europeans and the Americans behave. <laughs> we're just gonna maximize what we can do. Now, so we have to be careful because well, I fully welcome and I agree with the uh, arrangements for the African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement and regional integration. It's not going to solve all these problems. <laughs> that's, that, that's, we have to be realistic uh, for two reasons. One is even Africa as a, as a continent is not that powerful. Let's be fake, you know, in the global, I think Sub-Saharan Africa's GDP is, is the same as Belgium. Um, uh, 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 and uh, so it, it's, it's still not a powerhouse. The other is regional integration means individual countries are giving up some of their sovereignty in order to integrate. And that's sometimes very difficult for some countries because they're still having to face the, 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 the politics of their domestic, of their domestic voters. Um, and that's one reason why somebody, I think KY mentioned earlier, there been the whole history of regional integration attempts over the years. People have signed all sorts of agreements in Addis and Abuja and places like that, but they haven't really been implemented because having signed those agreements, you come back home 
and you realize, oh my God, I can't give up that sovereignty because I have to make sure I win the next election. Uh, and that's not going to get me there. So we have to be realistic about how much we can get out of uh, the African Free Trade Association. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I think there's a, there's a lot that countries can do today to make the best of the global trading system, unequal as it may be. But this also brings us back to the point you raised about governance, which I want to explore a little bit more, because um, the, the, to some extent, the developmental state, the flaw in the developmental state is that it, it tended to be impositional rather than responsive. Uh, it was top down, not bottom up. And uh, as you said, uh, Shanta, it's very important that uh, for and, and KY, for development to be well but grounded, there has to be a sense of ownership. Um, this question of liberalization, uh, let's take Nigeria for an example, uh, the government is prey to enormous vested interests, which don't necessarily reflect the views of the majority, but people who have political influence. Um, and that you could argue was responsible for the killing of the, the Kano textile industry because of more, more powerful people wanted to import cheap clothes. Um, and the, the current uh, nonsense of closing the border with Benin. Uh, it was vested interests that wanted to protect their markets. Um, so what are the crucial steps to help uh, a, a genuinely responsive economic policy in African governments? Uh, as KY says, it needs strong institutions, it needs inspired leadership. How do you bring the people in so that uh, policies can be adopted with public support that are going to be economically beneficial, not destructive. That's a $64,000 question. Hey, why? And your, your book sort of ends up on this point. How do we do this? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that before I, I try to address that question, maybe Binta could also come in in terms of from the gender perspective. How yes, I, I want to come to that as well. Yeah. But, but uh, there's a the question of inequality, which has been inequality. raised. Yeah, the, the issue, but I want to go quick one, one second or one minute on the regional integration dimension, because I think it's very critical. And I agree with what Shansa said and all that. But you see, the problem sometimes when we talk about Africa in the rest of the world, we talk as if there's one Africa. Hmm. Africa is a collection of 54 different countries. <laughs> so we have to always bear that in mind. When we're talking about Africa and the rest of the world and trade and all that. Anyway, so that's where the regional integration agenda comes in. There are certain issues we in Africa have to need to learn to collaborate on across borders, create regional public goods, for example, in particular, transport corridors, deal with the, even the COVID and all that. So there are some fundamental things we need to do. And then that will allow us also to integrate into the world economy. So, so in fact, we have a report and Shanta knows, Albert knows that asset is coming our report next month on precisely this issue that we spent the last year or so working, integrating to transform, where we address many, many of these issues in terms of, and we say the AFCT is important, but regional integration is not just, just about trade and markets, okay? It goes much, much broader than that. So I just wanted to pack that 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 point. Or otherwise, my colleagues at Asset would be upset with me <laughs> if I don't think of integrating to transform, which we'll be working on. Okay. Yeah. Now go to your question, you know, in terms of the governance issue. And I think you, Nick, in your review brought that up. That I didn't really hit that one. I brought the Ghana issue, the Rwanda issue, the leadership issues, developmental state approaches, but really, and Shanta has also brought that up in terms of how do you empower citizens? How do you engage citizens? How do you make sure that whatever we do in holding governments accountable, the voices of the people are important? And I think that's increasingly becoming clear I think when I started and the book in the 90s and even the early Twitter, civil society was not there. Mm -hmm. Many of these countries were, you know, one party state, dictatorship, uh, the free press, the media. Okay, it was on there. But in today's era, you have the mechanisms and the tools 
to be able to engage citizens and citizens have become very vocal. If I take my own country, Ghana today, there's a lot going on in that space. But there's something called fix the country where civil society and the youth are demanding, making demands on governments, not just this government and say, and that also resonates with some of the things we've done at Asset. If you look at Ghana's development over the last 30 years, we take two steps forward, one back, because the politics, the lack of accountability, irrespective of whatever government is in, has held us back. So the citizens are now saying enough is enough. Mm -hmm. yes. Thanks. Move so I agree. <laughs> and that's where the agenda is. And I think the tools are there. Uh, to I, engage more. I, I think, uh, as you say, the voice is coming from the citizens themselves. The question is yeah. whether the leaders will hear. Yeah. But I want to come back to Bineta because this question of, of gender links also to a, a wider question raised by Donald Sparks of the, whether you can um, achieve greater equality at the same time as achieving faster growth. Um, economic growth very often leads to a greater inequality. And there's another question from an anonymous person as to what is the role of traditional leaders, uh, mm. chiefs? Is it purely conservative or do they have a, a leadership role too? And both of these relate to your the, the challenge we face in terms of gender. Uh, studies elsewhere have shown bringing women into the economy provides a tremendous boost. Mm. In many African countries, women are in the economy, but it just tends to be in rather limited areas. Mm. So thank you so much. Um, let me just uh, maybe start with a small experience I had uh, with the, because we talk about institution and I know the World Bank have changed tremendously the way that they plan and they implement. Um, in the end 19s, I came um, and uh, were discussing with one of the leader of the bank. And I said, uh, how do you involve women in your program and your plan? And your answer to me was that when I'm building a road, what's the role of gender into this? I, I don't see it. So it means that things have evolved from the institutional perspective now. And we could see and that um, you know, the program now have a gender length, but also women are part and parcel um, of, of this. You talk about, uh, for example, Gozi, that so many African women and others have been part um, of this in this journey. So I think, and of course, because you hear the, the men or the women telling you, yes, we need infrastructure. No, no doubt that when it comes to growth, you need to build infrastructure for African development, no doubt of it. But the young people, when they see, don't see them themselves and the women into that plan, you know, they are excluded. And what they tell you, we don't eat the road. Even the road is going to impact on their life, those are going to impact, um, but they want to see more on that. They want to see um, the health issues included, uh, the education of their children and the, and the food. Let me just give an example. We are talking about feeding Africa right now, especially after the COVID. How do we keep, uh, pick up on the agriculture sector? We know that 70% of women, at least 70, in the whole agriculture value chain, are women, you know, from the production to the transformation, et cetera. But the whole issue is how do we scale it up? How do we make sure that it's impacted? How do we accelerate? What is the uh, accelerator that we have in our hand? Is it going to be the digital? Um, in Africa, first we talk about access to land. And here I can link it with them, even with the traditional chief, because most of them are the ones sitting, you know, um, at the local level on the land issue. So if we don't transform and make sure that we, uh, the policy that have been ad adopted at AU and a country are implemented at local level. But that's a big issue for women to have access to land. I'm not just even saying owning land, but just having access to land, not a small one portion uh, while the husband is not, but you know, occupying, but the women are the one on the ground. How do we have access to finance? I think how do we have access to new technology to accelerate it? So this is, if we want to feed Africa, this one example, we need to empower women 
I mean, that's, that's our, our fight right now with the African Union at the policy level, but also in action on the ground. Uh, we, we, we debate Ellen Johnson, all of us, we sat with the head of state, uh, 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 president of South Africa, um, and also uh, the newcomer, which is uh, uh, DRC. So we are all talking to them to, and they declare uh, the decade, the coming decade, uh, the 10 years to come is going to be the year for financial inclusion and women empowerment. But we need to see solution on the ground because you can take policy at that level, but what we need is action on the ground. So the growth, you know, which most of the country have come down. I mean, Senegal was at the highest level, my country. Now we are 1% um, of the growth, uh, but the women and the young people, we feel are not paying attention to them. And many are in the street to say that we don't, and COVID have brought this more, um, you know, gaps, into the development agenda right now. Um, so we need really to empower them. We need to concentrate on our efforts on the people. So on the traditional, we, we, you know, unless you engage them in the discussion. One example in Africa, for example, on fighting against HIV AIDS, you know, we had good practices and good solutions because we involved them in the discussion um, underground even for female genital mutilation. If you don't, I mean, we didn't talk about, we talk about the role of the men because uh, KY is a great example that when men are involved with women at the table, we can make that change. It's not about pushing men and bringing women, it's how do we work hand in hand in an equal society where, because it's a societal change. You change the society because you are making sure that women are in bed. But the traditional chief and the religious, because I work a lot in the Sahel, if you don't bring the religious leaders at the table to discuss the education of the girl, the early marriage, and so on, those phenomena that are impacted on the children of Africa, you know, you will not move that agenda because our politicians, what they're looking at is the vote, the day, and those people have the power into the, 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 uh, the voting system, as we know. So it's the population who have to interact with the religious leader and to make that mind ch um, uh, mindset change and make sure that we move the paradigm. And I think women and the youth have to be part and parcel of the discussion um, uh, in the development and economic agenda of Africa. Thank you. Well, thanks, Benita, and I pay tribute to your efforts to change that agenda. I think it's been very important. And as you say, at the African Union level, a lot of this has been recognised, but it's got to be mainstreamed and come from below as well as above. We are sadly reaching the uh, end of our time. There are a few questions about the quality of African data um, that uh, we haven't had a chance to explore. But I just wanted to give uh, each of you, uh, ending with, with KY, a chance just to reflect on what you would draw as, as the one key lesson from KY's book, from this discussion, that you think we, re we should all be pressing on the African economic policymakers, the leaders. So let me start with you, Albert. Thank you very, very much, Nick. And, and, and thank you for such a stimulating discussion. Uh, on, on a fantastic book that I really recommend to, to everyone. Um, <clears throat> the, the one lesson that I take away from this book is, is actually hope. It's actually hope because um, despite all these issues uh, that, uh, you know, KY has faced throughout this wonderful journey. He has shown us without arrogance and without really, um, you know, without, without pompous uh, declaration that, you know, we can actually do something about it. Wherever he has been, he has actually made a difference. And, and at the World Bank, he made a difference at the ECA, he made a difference. And through ASEP, he is making a great, great difference. 
And I know this because I work with him on asset. I, you know, I've, I've, I've really uh, come to uh, support what he's doing in asset. And I see how those ideas are being shared across the policymakers, you know, uh, you know, platforms in, in, in Africa. You know, when I had KY on my podcast series, Afronomics, we talk about how important it was to strengthen those institutions of learning and policymaking across Africa. And this is what he has made as difference. KY has created the most, one of the most credible uh, think tanks in Africa. And so my main message is, despite all those challenges, there is hope. And, you know, even a single person working in collaboration with others can make a difference. And I'm hopeful about Africa. Thanks. Thank you, Albert. I agree with you strongly that ASSET has helped Put Africa's voice on the world stage. It is a, it's a body that is listened to, as well as listening to Africa itself. Um, Shanta. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I'm really quite energized about what we can do going forward. So I think the, the, the message I take away, um, which is very much reflected in the, the interventions, is that while we are dealing with some of the similar problems that KY encountered over the last 50 years, the conversation is very different. Mm. And that's, that's the important point that we are building on what KY has built. Uh, we, we are building off of what K, KY has built in a way that is very different. It's almost 180 degrees different from what it was 50 years ago. We, people don't question the importance of gender equity. That is now just part of our DNA. There's still big questions about how we can promote it, uh, but that's a different conversation from the one where we had to justify it. People don't question the idea that we need to empower poor people to be able to hold their governments accountable. That is now a given. We have to still work on implementation. How do we actually get there? But that's a very exciting agenda. And I'm really looking forward uh, to the, the the next phase um, uh, of, uh, uh, of, 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 this, uh, of this agenda. And really, uh, it, it reinforces the point of the, of the book. It is important to know the beginning well. Yeah, thank you. And I, you're right. I think uh, KY and the ECA have changed the climate. We are now that the debates have changed because of that debate. Uh, Bineta, let me pass to you. Uh, let me just say that um, I have myself learned a lot by reading KY's book. Um, uh, you know, when you are advocating for change, you know, anything when it comes to macroeconomics or, you know, they uh, intend not to get attention on the women's and the gender issues. But I realize, as uh, uh, Shanta have said, that's part of the, our DNA now, you know? So KY started and we can see that uh, it has been one of the leader to bring this agenda in Africa. Um, so for me, uh, the journey continues. It should not stop there. I am looking forward for the second book and I also this book for asking my children and my grandchildren because I'm a grandmother and asking my grandchildren to make sure that they even get into the book and see. But I'm also asking KY uh, to look on the second book. Uh, the second book will be, uh, you know, to share the work that um, you are doing great work on assets. Uh, I won't say an outsider, but an insider and an outsider in the meantime, because where you are sitting in the think tank, uh, you are, it's more flexible position to be able to influence and you are influencing the whole um, uh, macroeconomic policy in, um, uh, in Africa. So I wait for the second book, um, especially with the experience on COVID, COVID-19. Um, I think that, uh, you know, to reset the button or to build back better. I don't know if we start again or are we continuing those the experience that we are all seeing, um, how we can uh, 
rebuilt back better, but to wait, waiting for the second book. And uh, to the Royal Academy, thank you for, for the invitation. And uh, I'm sure that the student, it will be out there and everybody will access to this book and uh, eagerly waiting for the second book. Thank you. Thank you, Bineta. And uh, they will have access to the book, but also to the podcast for those who were able course. to yeah. listen in today. Um, this will be recorded and on the African Arguments website. Uh, I'm going to give you the last word, KY, but uh, I'm very grateful to Bineta also for mentioning COVID, which has been a sort of slight ghost at our feast. Um, because of the challenges it has uh, faced. But I drew one conclusion from your book um, before uh, you speak, KY, and that is that meetings matter. And <laughs> there are an awful lot of meetings put, reported in your book. And uh, you know, those of us who have sat through many, many meetings, they can be pretty dull and they can be pretty contentious. But it's actually getting the people, the politicians into the room and making them talk about these things in a way that isn't just reading out their script but actually having to face something, which sometimes only happens when you're doing a communique. Um, that's when the rubber hits the road and they have to justify their ideas and they can be influenced by them. So I look forward post COVID to having live meetings once more, because that's where you can really put pressure on people. But uh, KY, over to you, please. Yeah, thank all of you very much for a very fascinating discussion for all the kind words you said about me personally, very moving, I knew you meant it, but we all, I couldn't have done what I've done without friends, without mentors, without colleagues. So this is not just about me. The book is about me plus many, many other people and the opportunities I had to move the agenda forward. But in terms of giving everything I've heard and Peter wants me to write another book, so when if I finally were to write retire. another book, what would the book be about? Based upon everything we've said today. And the proverb says, if you know the beginning where the end shall not trouble you. I didn't spell out what the end would be. I didn't. But from everything we said in reaction to the book, I can tell you today that for me, you should not surprise because we talked about my family, my mother, my children, my wife. The end is about the future of Africa's children. It's the future. My journey has come to an end. So what do I foresee? What should the future and what should we do? You hear all this about youth unemployment jobs. We write about it all the time, but to me, the demographic. So what do we need to do to ensure? And that's where the rubber will hit the road. That's one. And related to that will be the gender issue. How those two factors can really, and if I can say the end. Now, the other thing is, uh, you know, we talked a bit about optimism. Whether given all the challenges we face in Africa today, the sense of optimism. And we brought, Kofi Annan's name has come up quite a bit. And there was an earlier book I did many years ago when I was at UC, and he did the forward to that book. And I described myself as an optimist for Africa. You know what Kofi said? Yeah, KY, you are an optimist, but you're also a realist. And then he posed this question to me. You know the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? I said, no, boss, I don't. He says, well, both an optimist and a pessimist can be wrong, but the optimist dies a happier person. So in terms of the end of the journey, I want to die a happier person. And if we can focus on the youth and the gender, these issues about our children, future and put all these factors we talked about to drive that agenda 10, 15, 20 years from now, then I will not be troubled <laughs> at the end of this journey. So now I want to read to you my favorite passage in the whole book. Okay. That will reinforce that. Uh, share the screen. 
We talk about my family, my children, my wife, and my grandchildren. This is a passage there where I say we have more than enough data to make an educated guess on the pathways to transform Africa. I do not know if Mina, she's one of my granddaughters, will see the Ghana I have just described or the future of the country I have em just envisioned my whole life, but I hope she does. I believe she will. My journey is nearing its conclusion. Hey, Jenny, and a better one for Africa. It's just beginning. So it's about the future. Hey, anyway, why? thank you very much. That was very moving, Tripp. Yeah. And your uh, whole endeavor, I think, has helped us on that journey. So thanks very much, so much to KY, to Shanta, to Benetta, and to uh, uh, Albert. Uh, that's been a most interesting and illuminating discussion. And we will take the debate forward from here. But uh, KY, once more, a tribute to everything you've done. And Thank you. Thanks oh, to okay. all our audience for being with us. I hope that's been as illuminating for you as for us. But thanks to everybody. And uh, do post copies of the uh, podcast to all your friends and relations. Okay. So that it, the word spreads. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks also to uh, Naomi and to Hoda and to Raga and to Tale behind the scenes who made sure everything went smoothly. It's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you all so much and goodbye for now until the next one. Thanks, KY. Okay. Thank you.